welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, so do you. So uh, let's just go before the Lord. Will you stand to your feet and let's go before God. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord, your house that you built by your grace. We just thank you, Father, that we haven't come into this place to hear from a man. We don't go to church to hear from a woman. We don't go to hear church to hear from an old man, a young man, black man, white man, brown man. We haven't done that, Lord. We've come to hear from the Holy Spirit, who is a teacher of the church. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Bless these people, bless our ears this day, and bless all the churches that are meeting, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. 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 Well, Merry Christmas and welcome. I know Jim's already greeted you. And so this morning we are going to speak on Christmas. And the reason that we do this is that at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, we know and we have a God assignment on us to teach and to preach Christmas because Christmas belongs to the church. We are living in a time and an age when we've become a very secular society. And nativity scenes are now being taken out of public parks and public places, schools. Crosses are being taken out of vet veterans' memorials and graveyards. And Christianity is becoming something that is not popular. But I'm here to tell you that God is not politically correct. He doesn't give a rip whether he is in or out with the political party or the powers that be. He made the universe, he runs the universe, he owns the universe, and he sent his son Jesus Christ. That is why it's called Christ Mass. And yes, he probably wasn't born on December 25th, but somewhere back in time, the church fathers decided to take a day and redeem it. <laughs> to take a day and redeem it. I said to take a day and redeem it. Do you know why? Because Satan has not created one day. He has not made the sun shine or the moon to rise. He has not created the heavens and the earth and not one day belongs to Satan. So if any demonic cult has taken a day, whether it's Halloween or whether it's whatever, God has taken the day and the church is to redeem everything Satan has stolen. Everything, everything. Rainbows belong to God. Evergreen trees belong to God. Creation shouts in Romans chapter 1, and creation declares the power of the Godhead according to Romans chapter 1. Therefore, there isn't one thing God created on this earth that God has not made holy and good. Man may have corrupted it, but God's in the business of redeeming and restoring, and that's the assignment he's given to the church. So therefore, we can celebrate Christmas. Whether it's on the, the 25th of December, whether he was born sometime in May, I don't know when the Lord was born, but the point is Christmas is a time when the church takes time to step back and look up and be in awe and wonder at what God has done. And if we don't do that, and if we miss that opportunity, then we've missed the most important part of the year. And God wants us to celebrate and have fun and to rejoice the angels came to the shepherds and said, Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was a heavenly host, and they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest of the high, and peace on earth, goodwill towards men. God's will is good towards mankind at Christmas. It's good. And no matter what kind of a Christmas you may be having, because a lot of times Christmas cannot be a fun time of the year. A lot of times we can get stressed out and we can get broke because of the foolishness of our culture saying we have to buy our children and our grandchildren every new toy and gimmick that comes out. Because Christmas is not about presents under the tree. Christmas is not about 
commercialism. Christmas is about the saints of God stepping back, looking up, and being in awe and wonder because truly, he is the wonder of it all. Yeah. Truly, he is. So this morning, Jim and I want to bring you three things about the incarnation. And we want to teach you and, and share with you, and for many of you, this is not, it's not new. We've taught Christmas. I don't know how many Christmas messages we've had over the last 35 years, but each one is a privilege. And each time, like this song, we sing this song every Christmas, but each time I hear it, it's a joy to my heart. So we're going to be looking at the Christmas story this morning. We're going to be looking at the incarnation, and we're going to be looking at what the incarnation reveals. Because God is a God of show and tell. Nobody had seen him. Nobody knew what he looked like. No man can see his face and live. So God sent his son, who is the express image of his person, the brightness of his glory, Jesus Christ. And if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. God sent his son to show us what God was like and what the kingdom of God is like, because God is a king and he has a kingdom. And God brought the kingdom of God to earth. And this is about what God shows and tells, because God's a God of demonstration and definition. And therefore, today, there's three things that God is going to define in the incarnation and demonstrate to us. And we want to touch on those three things. The love of God, the humility of God, and the power of God. And so my assignment is two, and then Jim's going to come up and teach on the humility. But let's look at the love of God first. First of all, let me define incarnation because it is a, a theological word. And what does it mean? The, incarna the incarnation is not found in the word of God. It's an English word. It means demonstrated. It, excuse me. It means to enter into or to become flesh. Jesus Christ, the pre-existent Son of God, became man in time, in space, and in history. There was a moment in time when God brought forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians chapter 5, and God brought forth this son. And that's what the incarnation is. It's God becoming flesh. It's God stepping out of eternity, disrobing himself of the privilege that belonged to his deity. He did not dismiss his deity because he's all God. And God fused with humanity, the human nature, not the sin nature that man had taken on because of the fall, but a perfect and a, and a perfect human nature, and God became man. God joined his God nature with humankind, which puts you and I in a very elevated position. Can I get an amen on that? What is man that you are mindful of him, and who is a son of man that you would put all things under his feet? So God becomes flesh, the incarnation. He steps out of, out of eternity and he steps into time and John introduces this in John the first chapter in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and all things were created by him and through him and without him nothing was made that was made and the word the logos became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory so John teaches of it Isaiah prophesied of it it was spoken of in Genesis 4,000 years before the Lord was born that there was one coming Satan. There was a war enmity between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. God spoke to the devil, the serpent, and he said, listen, there's one coming. You're going to bruise his heel, but he is going to crush your authority and your kingdom. And he will be born of the seed of the woman. So God spoke of it. Isaiah prophesied it. All through the Old Testament, I, I'm privileged to teach Christology in, in, the, in our theology school, in our Bible college. And you, there is a, a scarlet thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation, and it is all about Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God is, look at Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. He is the Word of God made flesh. And the incarnation is truly truly the most miraculous thing that's ever happened and without it there is no salvation without the incarnation without the virgin birth there is no cross there is no lamb of god that's qualified to climb on that cross and take on the sin of the world there can be no resurrection so this is the very foundation of our christianity the incarnation and that's why you and i must look at it and we must reverence it and we must celebrate and be in joy over it because truly it's beyond the finite mind to grasp so three things that it demonstrates and defines the love of god why does the incarnation demonstrate the love of god because god is a passionate god of love he is love and i want to just take you quickly to so the song of solomon and i want to read you a very interesting verse 
the Song of Solomon, verse chapter 8, verse 6 through 7, it says, and this is a Shulamite. She is the bride of the king. This could be a typology of Jesus and the church. It's also a wonderful book on marriage. That the Shulamite loves the king. And she says of him, and this is what she says, place me like a seal over your heart. In other words, wear me as a necklace. Put some jewelry on. Let me be that seal on your body. Like a seal on your arm and like a bracelet that's going to embrace your strong arm, almighty oh king. Place me like a seal on your arm. Here she describes love. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fire, the brightest kind of flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. If a man tried to buy love with all of his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. What does God say? He's passionate. He invented love. He is love. You cannot quench the thirst of love. You cannot drown the passion of love with the floods of life. And you cannot buy love. And God says, you can give everything you have for love. And you'd be scorned because love cannot be bought. It can only be received. And it can only be given. Now, this is the kind of God that we have. Passionate. Overwhelmed with us who is so in love with us that he is unwilling to be without us. And yet so many of us this Christmas are gonna feel alone and without. Bad things have happened to you. Christmas might have a bad story or a sad story in your life. Therefore, it's hard to rejoice at Christmas. But that's where you have to take the faith of God in your heart and set that aside and realize that for some reason that I don't understand, God has determined to be passionate over humanity. And God has determined that the fires cannot be quenched and that the floods cannot drown it and that hell cannot usurp it and that no money can buy it. But God's love is seen in the fact that he, God of heaven and God of earth, stepped out of eternity, stepped into the very womb that he created nursed on the very breast that he made and said, I will become like you so that I can be your kinsman redeemer. I can redeem, I can reconcile, and I can restore you to myself. Now, if that's not love, I don't know what is. We are loved, infinitely loved beyond all human understanding. So church, what does that mean? It means that God had to demonstrate it to us and he had to define it. He does it well in Romans 5, 6. He says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time, speaking of the incarnation. He came at just the right time. Born of a virgin. Born of young people. I love that God uses kids. I love that God takes teenagers and the youngest of the young, you know, when we don't have any brains, Boy, was I stupid when I was young. I'm not sure I'm much smarter now. But God believes in young people. And he came to this virgin, and it says that in the fullness of time, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time. And by the way, it was the worst time. Rome was in power, and it was the worst time in human history. So bad times are just simply Theater sets for God's power and his love to overcome and overwhelm. So if you're in a bad time, you're in a good place for God's miracle working power. God came at just the right time and died for sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some perhaps might be willing to die. For someone that is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And the incarnation shows the Lamb of God, born of a virgin, this beautiful baby, brought into the earth, born so that he could grow, he could understand every human endeavor, he could be tempted with every temptation so he would be qualified to be the high priest of our confession. He walked through every human temptation and experience overcoming so that he could show us the way and say, come on, kids, follow me because I've given you the kingdom now if you believe. And just as I walk the earth, you're going to walk the earth and greater things that I did, greater things you will do because I go to the Father. 
demonstrated the kingdom of God to us, healed the sick, raised the dead, gave sight to the blind, caused the deaf to hear, and said, fear not, little flock, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, and he was the vessel that it would come through. That baby in a manger, that one that was born of a virgin, that one would become the Passover lamb, slain from the foundation of the world, and would cause our Christianity to have life, everlasting life, and redeem, reconcile, and bring us back. If that's not love, I don't know what is. It defines and demonstrates the love of God. Here's the application, Pastor, come on up. If I'm so loved, then this Christmas, there's a couple of things that I can do to reciprocate the love that's been given to me. See, love can only be given and it can only be received. It can also be rejected. And Jesus said that because you're loved, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. So in the commandment to love others, to love humanity, I was just thinking of a couple of really short, practical things that I can give you before Jim comes. What can we do? Well, we can be willing to be great nobodies this Christmas. And Jim's going to explain that in just a minute about humility. To serve and not to be served. It's going to be hard work. I've got to go Christmas shopping on Monday because I've done nothing. I am not looking forward to it. I am not looking forward to wrapping presents. I am going to be cooking. I'm going to be cleaning. I have decorated because I'm the heart of the home, the mom of the house. And I know if I don't put Christmas in my house, it is not going to happen because that man right there, as wonderful as he is, is not going to be decorating that Christmas tree. So girls, if you want to have a party in your house, you're it. But that's love. It's serving when you don't want to. It's rapping at 12 o'clock at night when you don't want to rap at 12 o'clock at night. It's trying to figure out how you're going to buy somebody a present when you don't have any money. And guess what? You don't have to spend money. You can give yourself. So let's be willing to be great nobodies. How about that? How about this one? Look for the good, not the bad, because the bad is so easy to see. The bad is glaring. It's everywhere. You can turn on the news and hear all about it. But you see, God hides his goodness. And sometimes you've got to look to see it. But when God sees us, he sees goodness. So if God can see a saved child of God in the midst of a very rank sinner like he saw in me, then, Lord, give me your eyes to see my family, my people, like you see them and like they could be. Not as they are, not how they've hurt me, not how they've made me mad, not how they've screwed up, not how they are always doing the same thing, not how they're mocking me and making fun of me, but God, help me to see my family, my friends, the people that bug me the most. Help me to see them like you see them. Help me to be a lover this Christmas. Help me to be a carrier and a container of the love that's been given to me. So incarnation demonstrates to us a couple of things, right off the bat. Number one, love. Here's number two, humility. I mean, if you stop and think about Jesus Christ, the King of glory, creator of the heavens and of the earth, Everything that there is seen was made by him. And you will find that he who speaks in planets and solar systems exist. The one who was worshipped by the heavens for eons of time. Probably millions and billions, even trillions of angels bowing down and worshipping him. Decides at this moment, at per perfect timing, to come back as a child. Born in a manger. You gotta be kidding me. If that's not a sign of humility, I don't know what is. The very first breath he takes in that stable was the smell of animal urine. The smells and the sounds of animals. <clears throat> Here's the king of glory given of himself taking a lower position. Humility simply means taking the back seat. If I want to define it easier, somebody else take the front seat, I'm taking the back seat. And that's the way it is. And sometimes, if there's anybody that could have taken the front seat, it was Jesus. Ritz-Carlton should have been born there, but he wasn't. 
He was making a statement to every one of us. That he came because he loved us so much, he was coming like broken humanity. And he was going to humble himself when he could have had the front seat, take the back seat. And that's what this is really all about. Humility has three realms for our understanding this morning. Before humility ever gets going, the first realm is humility towards God. You and I are going to have to come to a place in our walk with Jesus Christ where we finally surrender our will, our way, our want, our desire, our plan, our thinking, all to his. That we sit in the back seat and say, God, you're in the driver's seat. I don't want to be in the driver's seat any longer. My plan is not as good as your plan. My will is not as good as your will. My desires, even though I've had them all my life, <clears throat> are not my desires that are as good as your desires. I'm here on this planet to take the back seat to your will, your want, your plan, and your desires for my life. Number one, it's very important for us. It's got to be towards God. I don't know if you've ever known this, and I want to share it with you, but life is not about great accomplishments. When God spoke this to me, it just went off like a bomb. Life is about great obedience. Let me say it again. Life is not about great accomplishments. Life is about great obedience. And we will never have great obedience without humility. First, the submission to the ways of God, where we put him first in everything. Then life starts to accomplish things. And very important for all of us to see and hear, because oftentimes what we do is we want God to get involved in where we're at. We want God to get involved in our plans, our ways, our wants. God, will you, will you bless this? Will you do this? And God's saying back to us as loud as he can possibly say, it's not about your plans, it's about my plans. I'll bring your plans to pass, but it's first my plan. Like he says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and then all of these things will be added unto you. But first comes God's plan, God's way, and you have to be hum humble to do it. Because without humility, there'll never be obedience. Without obedience, there'll never be fulfillment of accomplishment. Is anybody listening? Very important for us. Second thing is there's got to be humility in the realm, if you will, of yourself. You're going to have to learn how to constantly take the back seat to your wants and your desires. The third thing is the realm of others. People who you deal with on a regular basis that you know you could do the job better. You know you can say it better. You know you can fulfill it. You know you can get it done, but you'll take the back seat and let them take the front seat. It's hard to do. But Jesus did just that with us. I'm going to take you to some verses. If you've got your Bible, I think you'll find it fascinating in Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians, the second chapter, verse number four says it like this. Let each one of you look out, not only for his own interests, but for the interest of others. Interesting verse, isn't it? Forget it, you can't do it. Here's a verse that you and I, as human beings, cannot do without humility. There's no way I'm going to look out for somebody else. There's no way my interest of others are more important than my own interests. Unless I take a position of humility like the example of Jesus Christ. But verse 5 comes along and makes a statement and says, let us this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, we need to change our thinking. To think like Jesus thought. Here's how Jesus thought, if you will, verse 6. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he knew who he was. You can know who you are. You're a child of God. You're born of the Spirit of God. You're blood washed. You're saved. You're headed for heaven. You're an heir and a joint heir with Jesus. You're not a loser. You're not a failure. You've got a future. You've got a destiny. You've got a purpose in life. You know you're a king's kid, but yet at the same time, you still take the back seat. That's hard to do. But Jesus does that. 
Let this mind be in me who knows who I am. I'm born. I'm washed by the blood. I've got the power of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me, but yet I'll still take the back seat. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation. He did it himself. He took his place. Didn't, you know, he, can I just say something? He could have had the greatest show on town. Can you imagine? I mean, he could, I mean, he could have had t-shirts with his face on them. He could have CDs that he sells. He could have the greatest priests, people worshiping, praising him. I mean, he could have had anything, but he doesn't. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. I love this word, bond servant. Here's the one that should have been served becomes a servant. All because of the mindset is he knew who he was. When you, listen, listen, listen. When you know who you are, you don't have to try to show off who you are. The only people who show off who they are are because they really don't know who they are. Is anybody listening? G doesn't go around bragging. Didn't have to. Didn't have insecurity about who he was. He was a, one who should be served becomes the servant. I think that's pretty cool. And coming in the likeness of man, verse number eight, here's the rewards of all of that. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Because without obedience, there's never accomplishment. But without humility, there's never obedience. To the point of death, even the death of the cross. And because of that, verse number nine, watch this. Therefore, in other words, because of his humble attitude, God exalts him and gave him a name above every name. You know the Bible says God will exalt those who are humble, but he'll put down those who are arrogant and promise. And verse number 10 comes along and he says, and at that name, every knee shall bow, every knee, heaven and earth, under the earth. I mean, what an exaltation. All because he took a humble position. There's power that breaks the world system in the word humility. Humility helps us to be obedient. Obedience helps us to accomplish. And therefore, you and I get blessed. But it starts with, if you will, humility. Our example in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. From the very beginning of this whole thing, he, he demonstrates and defines humility. Born of a virgin, born of a poor couple, born in a manger. God is so shouting to us about his power in this incarnation. Because have you not seen it already? The kingdom of God is nothing like the kingdoms of this world. It is nothing like the flesh. Everything that God does and everything that God is, is different than what we know in our natural world. In our natural world, you become mighty to conquer. In our natural world, kings are born in palaces. In our natural world, you gotta fight the, fit, the survival of the fittest, the evolutionary process, how foolish are we? And yet God who made the universe, runs the universe and owns the universe, like Jim says, doesn't have to be anything but who he is, God. And he says to his people, you don't have to be anything but who you are, sons and daughters of the Most High God. And God wants to empower us and deposit in us the power of the kingdom of heaven, just like he did Mary. But it doesn't happen like the natural. It is a supernatural thing. And let me show you quickly as we end this message today. So we've seen the love of God demonstrated and defined. We've seen the humility demonstrated and defined. Let's look at the power of God. Let's look at the virgin birth. What does it say to me? How does it demonstrate and reveal his power to me personally? Well, let me just give you some thoughts. He alone can save. He alone can save. There was no other way. There was no way that a man and a woman could produce a son that would be qualified to be the savior of the world because man was stained with sin and there was no life in him. We were dead. We were disconnected from God. So God steps out of eternity, steps into the womb that he created, and now he becomes man. But Mary could not make this happen. 
Mary could not conceive a child by herself. And when the angel Gabriel said to her, highly favored one, behold, you're going to bring forth a son. And let's look at Luke chapter one, one more time. And let's look at that verse. And let's look in, I'm not gonna to go to Isaiah, I'm gonna to go to Luke 128, John, if you could just put that up for time's sake. Isaiah had prophesied that the Lord would give us a sign, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. Now fast track 700 years from Isaiah, here we are. Gabriel is meeting Mary and he says to her, Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary asked the angel in verse 34, and she said, How can this happen? I'm a virgin. I've not been with a man, and here's where the power of God comes in. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary replies, and she says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, the humility that didn't spoke of. May everything you have said about me come true, and the angel left her. So what has this got to do with power? Well, let's just quickly look. God had a plan to bring to pass, but it could not depend on human flesh. The power of humanity in the natural realm will never access the power of the kingdom of heaven, never. Are you hearing me? Flesh cannot glory in the sight of God. That is why Jesus said, I've given you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But it'll come by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it will come through the new birth and the regeneration. It's called the church of the living God. Are you with me? Jesus is the resurrected Lord. All power and authority have been given unto him. And he told us to go, therefore, into all the world. He delegated that power to the church. And here's the lesson. In the incarnation, Mary could not do this. God didn't need her power to have a child. God needed her faith and her willingness to obey God. God doesn't need my ability. He doesn't need my human talents. God needs willing clay jar, plain paper bag vessels that will say yes to his plan and do what he says to do. It's as simple as that. God deliberately chooses the weak and the foolish to confound the wisdom of this world. God is constantly making a statement. The great and the mighty king of all creation is constantly showing and telling where his power is. His power is not found in the great abilities of human flesh. His power, his power is found in the human heart that believes and does what God is asked to do. My last verse for today is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We now have this light shining in our hearts, and we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. And just like God deposited the seed in Mary, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And as that seed grew and became flesh, the last Adam, the one to reconcile us and redeem us and restore us, God wants to bring the kingdom of God because the angel said to Mary, with God, nothing is impossible. God wants to take the word of God and he wants to take it to a believing heart and he wants to impregnate that believing heart with that promise and that word. And just like Mary, let it grow and let it be birthed. And the kingdom comes to us. It's birthed in us. And then it works through us to a world that has no idea who God is. So this Christmas, remember, God loves us. We are loved infinitely and absolutely beyond anything we can wrap our minds around. Just believe that. You are. The incarnation proves it. So let's be people lovers. As Jim pointed out to us, humility. 
humility, dependence on God, not independent selfish desires, but dependent on God's will and God's will alone. Willing to take the back seat, willing to be servants, willing to have your lives interrupted, willing to be inconvenienced and do it all with joy. And number three, the great power of God wants to come to you, birth in you, and work through you. Everything that you have need of, but beloved, far more than your needs because they will be taken care of. Because Jesus said, why do you worry about what you're gonna wear, where you're gonna live? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. But God would love the church to begin to grow up enough to realize I don't have to worry about my own needs, they're taken care of. But there are the needs of those in my life. And there is a kingdom and there is power and there is love that God wants me to distribute. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, the poor have the good news preached to them. Fear not, little flock. He's given you the kingdom this Christmas. I just want to take a moment. Thank you for letting me do this. It's probably the most important time of the whole service, at least one of them. So everybody remain seated. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Here it is, the year 2013. I pray that 2014 be your best year. There may be those of you that are in here that won't even make it through 2014. I want to make sure you're okay with God before you walk out of this building today. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. But answer it in your heart. Don't just stare at me. Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building and your heart stopped and you died, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And don't give me this, I don't believe in hell. Because you don't believe in it doesn't make it go away. It's a very real place. Answer the question, will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? Now, let's talk about your answer because you know what? Your answer says a lot about where you're at. Some of you said this, I think I'm going to go to heaven. That's what you said in your heart. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven? Like whoever's the most positive thinker is going to make it? You're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you answered and said, well, I hope I'm going to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because you hope you get to make it, you're going to make it? You're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you said, well, I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? I'm glad you do, but nowhere does it say in the Bible. You would think it would, but it doesn't. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God, you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible, and you can't get there that way. Listen, Jesus makes a statement. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven any other way but his way. Now, if he's going to make a statement like that, don't you think he ought to tell us just exactly how to get to heaven? Or do you think he just leaves it up to you to whatever you want, you know, and whatever that group thinks over there? And Well, that's a bit weird, but I guess they'll get in. No, he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. I'll share it with you in a moment. Some of you answered and said, wait a minute, I thought of myself as a Christian all my life. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I, I was a child. How many christened or baptized, Pastor, when I was a baby? Hey, I'm glad they did, but did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll get you to heaven? Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, you don't understand. I joined my last church. I was there for 14 years, sang in the choir. I was a leader in the church, counted the offering, helped the pastor, even taught Sunday school, graduated from their seminary school. Great. Could you show me where that's in the Bible? You get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it if you think that's going to get you to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus talks about it. In John, the third chapter, he says these words, you must be born again. 
And let me tell you what born again means, because most people don't understand what born again means. Only thing they know about born again people is they see them as idiots and radicals and fanaticals and goofballs because Hollywood has portrayed born again people as jerks. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. So let me tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. It means you've given God all your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Someone needs to tell you just exactly the way it is. God forgive us in American churches. We've watered that down for 250 years in America. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. I don't want you to miss it. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you by the scripture, not just make a statement without proof. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, you've heard of it, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. He says, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Wow. What a crude, rude statement right from the mouth of Jesus. I'll vomit you from my mouth? Who's he speaking that to? He's saying it to people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm. They're not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited. Now let's define lukewarm for you. Here's lukewarm, little in, little out. Little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Watch lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything in your life. And therefore, you're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. And somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth. The truth is you're going to die and go to hell, even though you came to church today, unless you give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. And it's got to be you giving it to him. He won't steal it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to hit you in the head and make you do it. He could do that, you know. But he lets you have a free will choice. I choose Jesus above everything else. And at the end of your life, it'll be based on what you've done with the Son of God, whether you've given him all of your heart and life or not. And that's why he says there's no other way to get to heaven but his way. You say, well, pastor, how do I give him all of my heart? How do I give him all of my life? Well, let's don't do it my way or your way. Let's do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'm going to pound my Bible. I'll go, bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I know who Jesus is in my head. But I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. Now listen to me just for a moment. Listen, 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 listen. I already know, and so does God. You know who Jesus is in your head. You celebrated Christmas and Easter every year of your life, but that does not make you a Christian. Even the devil knows who Jesus is. And he's not going to heaven. It's about what you've done with your heart. And the raising of your hand says, I want to give God all of my heart and give God all of my life. I want to be born again. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, this is a great time to make sure that you don't miss when Jesus comes. This is your day of salvation. I'm going to count three. I've done my job. Today is your day. It's your call and your choice and your eternity. You choose it right now. Here it is. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's another one. Four. There's five back over here. God bless you. There's five wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? If you need to get your hand up, this is a time to do it. There's another one back over here. Six. God bless you. See you right there. And in the family room, there's just two. Six, seven, eight. Thank you. Another one back here. Nine. Thank you. Got him. Got him. Got him. Thank you. There's nine wise people. I know there's more. There's ten. God bless you. Good to see you. 
Anybody else? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Don't miss this opportunity. If you're sitting next to somebody, say, come on, if you need to get right with God, put your hand up and let's go. I'll go with you. Anybody? Listen, listen, listen. Anybody else? There's nine wise people. There's somebody back over this way. They're pointing. Hey, I think I already got you, but I'll count you twice because I love numbers. Ten. There's eleven. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for eleven wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 11 of you, here's what we're going to do. We're in a minute, we're going to stand and sing. No, no one leaves here in this period of time. All 11 of you that raised your hand, once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. But if you're serious about God, I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to get a friend if you need to. But if you're sitting with somebody, just say, come on, I'll go with you. If you're serious about God, if you're in the family rooms, bring your children. I want you to hurry, get your stuff, get in the aisle. We're going to sing this song. We're going to clap for you. And I want you to meet me right here in front. Everybody stand and let's welcome them as they come. If you're serious about God, you need to come. You come right now. Come, 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 come. Thank you for coming. Put a smile on your face. It's a good thing. I want you all to look to the left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Good guy. He'll tell you what he's going to do in just a minute. Pray with you. Give you some free stuff. Only takes a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.